I first heard Roger speak in the 1980s, and he talked about how when he first started at Lockheed, he was amazed that people would often say it was easier to redo research than to find it. And he set out to solve that problem, and he solved that problem by building a company to attack the problem of getting at the world's information, which is a noble mission which all of us are, are busy helping to fulfill. So Roger's here to talk about uh, his experience with dialogue, and I give you Roger. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan, and uh, thanks for inviting me to uh, talk to this group. Uh, I've, of course, as many, uh, admired Google for some time. In fact, the first time I heard of Google was from a fellow named Jeff Pemberton, who used to be in charge of the New York Times Information Bank, and he came up to me and he said, he said, Roger, now this must have been, you know, like 64, I mean 94. Was, was Google going in 94? No, 90, 96 then maybe, huh? Well, it's in the literature in 96. Well, anyway, it was, it was around that time, and he came up and he said, he said, I've found this, uh, this search engine that is just fantastic. And I said, yeah, yeah, Jeff, I've, I've heard that for many, many years, you know. And, uh, and he said, well, it's Google, and it damn near reads your mind when you want to do a search. And, and you'll see that I wasn't totally sympathetic with that notion at that time, but I've come to be a believer, so, uh, so I am uh, pleased to be here. Um, I, I feel a little overdressed, a little more formally dressed than, than usual, and I have to, the reason for that is that I'm retired, and I don't get a chance to dress up very often, and, and I find that if, if I don't, if I leave my clothes in the closet and don't wear them, next time I try to put them on, they're too tight. They've shrunk in the closet, you know? So, uh, so anyway, I thought I'd stretch it out a little bit here. Um, Okay, I'd, I'd like, I, you will get acquainted with me a couple of slides down, but I'd like to get a little acquainted with you in terms of, of a couple of things. Uh, first, I'd like to know how many people have heard of dialogue. About a little less than half, I'd say. Okay, of those, how many have used dialogue? Good, four. <laughs> Well, that shows the, well, I won't say what that shows. <laughs> uh, okay, and how many here are uh, in the engineering group, programming and engineering? Oh my golly, just about everybody. And how, how many are, do other things than engineering? <laughs> oh, so it's about, um, about three quarters, one quarter. And I, I, I don't know what those other things are and, and won't ask. Uh, okay. Here's what we're going to talk about this morning, and uh, I have a, a lot of stuff to present, and uh, so I hope it doesn't, um, well, I hope I can get through it, that's all. And of course, these are things that I think are fascinating, and all of you, some of you may agree with me, but uh, perhaps all of you won't. Uh, so what we're going to do is look at uh, information retrieval uh, in the uh, uh, relative to knowledge transfer throughout history, throughout, well, the history of uh, the human race. And, and that's to give us a perspective to put information retrieval and dialogue uh, design and development then into that perspective and talk a little bit about that. Now, I talk about information retrieval, you know, and you people call it search. You know, and we call it search. We call it search generically, but we Talk, we, we describe the process as information retrieval. And uh, it's interesting, on one of the websites that's a gardening website, you know, instead of having a button that says search, they have a button that says dig. <laughs> so we can call it a lot of different things, but we're talking about information retrieval uh, as a technology, or IM, which is what you would probably term search. Um, well, Dialogue started out as a, a laboratory project that I was in charge of. And then uh, we moved into a commercial commercialization phase and formed it into a company. And then uh, that meant that it was worth money. And so Lockheed, which is where I was, I was in the Lockheed Palo Alto Research Lab. So Lockheed figured out that uh, they could probably get more money out of selling it than operating it. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. 
And then I'd like to spend some time in what I call analysis and reflection in over, well, 30 years, actually, from the time we started Dialogue until I retired. I took an early retirement in 1991. Um, uh, there, you know, one uh, draws some observations and conclusions, and uh, I call them aphorisms, uh, and uh, that we'll conclude the uh, talk with that. Okay. If you want to uh, learn more about Dialogue after we're through, uh, you can go to their website, just uh, dialogue.com, and it's a very elaborate uh, website. It goes into a lot of depth of the company, of the products they offer today, and, and how they offer them. So I hope I'll stimulate some of you to, uh, to do that. Okay, now, I learned a little bit about you, and uh, here's a chance for you to learn a little bit about me. Uh, I, I, yeah, I can tell you that story. I had a meeting to go to yesterday at one o'clock in Oakland in all the rain and everything, and I had to get my slides transmitted over here before I left. And so some of what I have doesn't absolutely agree with some of what you will see. So um, on my slide here, I have something called personal interests. And I guess in the announcement of the Tech Talk, uh, Jonathan uh, enumerated those, but I'll, I'll, I'd like to bring them out because they relate somewhat to what we'll be talking about. Uh, music is just a real strong interest with me. I'm a performer and a listener, and I do some writing, and I discovered a great program called Audacity, which is a free download, which is one of the best music editing programs that I've ever run across. So well, that's just a little freebie. Um, so music, uh, tennis is my sport. Uh, I, I like to sail and uh, used to do a fair amount of sailing until my wife and I got into a 60 knot gale. And once we got docked, she climbed off the boat and she said, I'll never get on this boat again. So my sailing days uh, are, are limited now. Um, at Stanford, uh, I had a girlfriend in, well, I went to Stanford, my undergraduate was uh, 48 to 52. And I had a girlfriend in 1950 that uh, one time told me, you know, there's this thing that's been invented called a digital computer. And we had long conversations about, oh, the ENIAC and the, uh, uni, the first UNIVAC and the fact that this, this machine stored a program, a, a control program, much as it stored its data. And even beyond that, that the program could be modified or modify itself as it progressed based upon conditions that it sensed or got from, uh, got from the ex external sources. Uh, well, I had taken some psychology and to me, that was just sort of the essence of what the human being does in terms of adaptive behavior. And so I was fascinated and I decided through those conversations that the computer was going to be a major part of, of my, my uh, future and my career, as it turned out to be. So um, I had, in, in those days, um, we, we didn't have computers to use. But uh, when I came back to graduate school, there was a course on the IBM 650, if anyone has heard of that, which was one of the first IBM computers. And uh, we, with the instructor, a fellow named Bob Oakford, learned to program it together. It was all in, uh, well, I don't know what you'd call it, fundamental assembly language. I mean, it was just numbers, you know, and numbers meant uh, do something to this register or add or whatever. And uh, then something called SOAP came along, Symbolic Optimized Programming, so AP, Assembly Program, Symbolic Optimized Assembly Program. And this allowed you then to assign symbols, like AD, you could sign for add, instead of remembering 60 for add. And, and I just thought this was the end of the world, now that we didn't have to remember all those damn numbers. Um, so we did that, and then I took some courses in operations research, and learned some things that uh, will come into the talk later on that were quite useful. In, in terms of influential readings, um, in Individual Differences is a psychology book, and I think it's, you probably still get it on Amazon in a second-hand form. But I, I learned from that the great variety of differences that exist among individuals. You know, in our own experience, we tend to have Oh, a kind of a narrow spectrum of people that we know. 
but in, in this book, uh, they go into just the great variety of what's normal. You know, I mean, you know, beyond your uh, uh, conclave of acquaintances, you say, oh, that's pretty abnormal down there, pretty abnormal over here. But I mean, in terms of normality, it gave me an appreciation for the wide spectrum of, of people uh, and interests and objectives that exist. Uh, Habits um, was an important book to me uh, because I'd never realized how important habits were in directing one's life. I mean, habits are what drive us, you know, and so if we can make those habits effective, we can be more effective. If we can get rid of habits that aren't so effective, which is extremely difficult, you know, then that's a good thing too. Naval Communications History of World War II. Uh, it turns out that just about every disaster that both our side and the other side experienced in, 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 during that war uh, was a communications failure. And, and uh, this book gave me an appreciation that communications are, are so critically important in, uh, in doing things. And a final book here was Finite Mathematics that I read one summer um, between school years and that, that went into, uh, well, the important thing that went into was Boolean algebra. And it gave very nice examples of how Boolean concepts could be used in real life in, in terms of sets you know, anding and oring and nodding sets and so on. And uh, that, of course, came into uh, influencing the design of dialogue, as you'll see later on. Um, Pre-dialogue experience um, at LMSC, that's Lockheed Missiles and Space Company is what it's called, and that's Lockheed. And I went there as a, uh, uh, in between my dissertation, in between my orals and my dissertation, got a summer job and then stayed on there because I reported to the head of information processing at this large company. We had 70, 90 computers. And he gave me assignments in simulation and information retrieval. With regard to simulation, I built a model um, of the aerospace industry, which was used as in training executives uh, to manage companies uh, in aerospace. And, uh, and it turned into my dissertation uh, after I added a, uh, uh, an algorithmic decision maker that competed with the human beings making, decision make, uh, uh, d making decisions in operating the model. And that was a lot of fun. We did a oh, design of experiments to see what was significant and so on. Anyway, the dissertation was titled, uh, the, 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 it doesn't have a short title, Simulation of a Management Decision Process Utilizing a Computer Model. Now, if that doesn't sound impressing, oh, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Simulation of a management decision process utilizing a computer model of the aerospace industry. And that sounds pretty impressive to me, even now. And uh, it, it consisted of a massive Fortran program, many, many subroutines, and one master calling routine. And that's a story in itself. But in information retrieval, um, I and another programmer sat down and, and thought we'd figure out how to do information retrieval or searching. One problem was we didn't have any databases, you know, so we had to key in some little databases to play with. And uh, we, we sat on, we thought, well, what we do is we take the words from the query, you know, parse the query into its terms, and then we match those terms uh, uh, on a quorum basis against the database. And the items that have the greatest number of those terms will rank at the top and sort them and then we'll have kind of a relevancy ranking of and then then we thought well we didn't what what I didn't like about that was that if the customer or the user didn't get what they wanted they were dealing with a black box they were dealing with an algorithm and the, and they didn't know then how to modify their query in order to get more relevant results out of the search. So uh, having read finite mathematics the summer before, we started fooling around with uh, Boolean, which of course is very explicit, and uh, the matchup is precise uh, in terms of the uh, search and the results. So anyway, we, we did a little experimenting with relevancy ranking, but uh, I turned a switch somewhere along the line, went to Boolean, and, and uh, we didn't do much more with that. Okay, now, uh, I think I'm getting more verbose than I want to be. So I'm going to kind of skim through this. There's a great book, uh, which I just, uh, I couldn't find my copy, so I went on Amazon 
and uh, it's out of print now, but there are secondhand copies for $6.50. And I thought, well, I'll just get another copy. Anyway, it's called The New Renaissance. In fact, the full title is The New Renaissance, Computers and the Next Level of Civilization. And uh, by this fellow, uh, Douglas Robertson. And it's, it's just a fascinating book to read in terms of getting both the context that we're dealing in and, and some of the places that everything's going. But he, uh, he outlined uh, several different uh, thresholds um, in the history of civilization, uh, each of which resulted in, in a massive information explosion relative to what there had been before. And so he goes back to the invention of language, the invention of writing, the invention of printing. And as you imagine this, you know, you can see the information just bubbling out of each of these uh, thresholds. Um, and uh, then the invention of the computer. Now, he, didn't, he did a little bit on the invention of information retrieval, but didn't go into that particularly. Um, but I'll go, I'll go, I'll delve, I'll spend a little more on time on the invention of the computer and the invention of information retrieval. Um, so with the computer, there were, well, when I, when I was at Lockheed, and in fact with the 7090 series and 7094s, uh, you did not do text processing with those computers. I mean, they were all numeric and they were used for uh, accounting or for scientific computation. And if you tried to do text processing in Fortran, if any of you have used that, you know, it's just, just horrendous, you don't. Uh, there were programs like Lisp around that were designed for text processing, but uh, we didn't get into those. So, um, uh, so anyway, with, with the computer, uh, what happened was uh, that computer typesetting uh, replaced the hot lead typesetting of, of the, well, of the post-Gutenberg era. Uh, in fact, uh, one of our databases, um, we went back and, and tried to negotiate with Wilson's, if anybody knows uh, the Wilson's collection, to get their database online, and they gave us a tour, and they were still setting hot lead. This is, you know, 65. No, no, this is in the 70s, in the early 70s. They now have switched. And, and uh, at Lockheed in the lab, uh, the guys would say, yeah, it's cheaper to redo research than it is to try to find out if it's ever been done before, even though we had reference librarians. So what, uh, what made everything, what, what really opened the door was third generation computer technology embodied uh, in the IBM 360. And, um, and that, that allowed us really to uh, couple the power of the computer with the intellect of the human being. And uh, we could go through examples of this, but I was reminded of it just as I was putting this presentation together, being, you know, using PowerPoint and being able to take my other computer and being able to branch off on the internet with Google to do research on a point as I was still keying in lines on here. I mean, the efficiency, and pro well, the efficiency that that allows is just incredible because when I was doing presentations back when we were putting the system together, I mean, I'd first type it out and draft. It would go to a technical editor who would kind of go through and clean it up a little bit. Then it would go to a layout guy that would uh, type it on a formatter and they'd, to edit it, you'd cut that document into strips and cut and paste it on strips and then you'd take it to a photo machine that would do view foils for you, you know? And heaven forbid, if you, uh, if you had a mistake in there, you couldn't correct it. And uh, I was able to, well, I, I made the final touches to this as I was waiting for you to gather here today. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I think, you know, I think you don't appreciate you don't appreciate this because you take it for granted, and that's perfectly fine, and there's no point in, in uh, uh, sort of retracing all those steps. Uh, but uh, it might be interesting to know that we've come a long, long way. Okay, so in terms of dialogue, um, this, uh, well, someone said it's a tool to relieve mankind of the burden of over-specialization and to allow the pursuit of ideas and the acquisition of new knowledge. And that's, that's what we were after. Our objective uh, has been one of empowering the customer and developing a, a technology more than in building a business and selling the business. Uh, 
Okay, so let's go into dialogue development a little bit. Uh, we got, okay, there, there was something called the Red Book that was published that talked about automating the Library of Congress. And Herschel Brown, who was a vice president of Lockheed at the time, thought this was a, an endeavor that was worthy of, of Lockheed resource. Uh, also, the Air Force had a list of objectives, of research objectives, that it would fund research on, one of which was information retrieval. So we were fine. We got some, uh, we got some independent research and set up the uh, information uh, sciences laboratory and started to work on information retrieval. And luckily, luckily for me, I guess I was appointed in charge of that uh, process. Uh, and we had some very exciting times. Well, let me tell you what our computer was. It was a, it was an IBM 360 30. It was one of the first ones that was delivered. Uh, it had 64K of core. I mean, that's that's what we call RAM these days. 64K, not 64 megabytes, 64 kilobytes. And uh, we had two 2311 disks, each of which had seven megabytes. And we had one 2321 data cell, which had 400 megabytes of storage. And I'll show you, uh, I'll, I'll go into that 21 data cell, uh, uh, 2321 data cell a little later, because that was the clunkiest part of the whole operation. But also, it was the cheapest storage that you could buy at that time. And it really got us into business. Uh, third generation technology, second generation technology was called batch searching technology. You had tapes that read in, you had a single job that could process at a time, and then you had a tape or a massive printout coming out the other side. And there was searching that was done on second generation technology, but it took forever and you couldn't modify your search. If you, if you defined your search a little bit too narrowly, then you got nothing and it took you a week or so to, to resubmit your search. If you defined it a little too loosely, you got a whole box of paper to wade through, you know, and, and so you couldn't conform it. And that all guided us in the design of dialogue as we went along. Um, but they were exciting times. I met a fellow named H. Peter Loon of IBM. Uh, Peter Loon invented SDI. Does anybody know what SDI stands for? Yeah, maybe somebody. Uh, anyway, it stands for Selective Dissemination of Information. And we now call that alerts, an alert, because that's what it did. So you guys have them, Dialogue has them, and they're, they're extremely useful. Um, well, when we, when we got going, we anticipated a lot of information retrieval applications, uh, such as automating the, um, uh, the files of uh, the state of California, the automotive files in the state of California, so that you could search. Well, and the whole key there was searching by content rather than by label. You know, in a phone book, you go and you search by label, largely. Uh, but... Um, uh, but the whole trick with information retrieval is being able to search by content. And of course, that's what you, you guys do on the internet. Uh, we were also going to, um, we were going to automate the modus operandi files of uh, the state of California or elsewhere. And this came about because my wife-to-be was living in Boston at the time of the Boston Strangler. Okay, if any of you have run into that. Anyway, he, he, he was uh, kind of a serial killer and she was a naive young woman that kind of wandered around the back streets. And every time I picked up a paper, I expected she'd be the next victim. Well, anyway, in analysis, there was a book written on it. In analysis, the one reason they didn't pick the guy up earlier was that he operated in several different jurisdictions, each of which had a, you know, a, a shoebox file of modus operandi. And also, they only had a single classification system. So that, you know, it was robbery, it was rape, it was this and so on. So he did a little bit of everything when, you know, when he went in. He did a little robbery, did a little rape, did a little murder. So they had him scattered all out throughout a number of files. And, of course, with a little bit of imagination, you can imagine on a computer, you know, that you can put that together in a way that you're going you're gonna to be able to identify the guy. And the fact that there are multiple attributes helps in narrowing the thing down. Anyway, so we were very excited about the whole thing. And um, let me tell you a little bit about the, data, the IBM 2321 data cell. Is anybody aware of this machine or familiar with it? Okay, it's fun. It's a, it's a mechanical electrical pneumatic hydraulic device. 
okay, and any of those systems could fail. It required, uh, it, it required 23 liters of motor oil to operate for the hydraulic system, and, and, uh, and the hydraulic system was like a British motorcycle. You know, they say the only thing that doesn't leak oil on a British motorcycle is the handlebars. Well, this thing leaked oil, and we had a kitty litter pan in, in the bottom of this thing to catch the oil that it leaked. Um, it had an average of one second access time to get to a record. Okay, and we had 24 or so before we sold them off and switched to disk. Uh, uh, 24 of them amounted to about one gigabyte of storage, and that's what we were in business with, making good profits, as you'll see later on. But it was cheap. It was cheap, and they got cheaper because the reliability was so poor. So we just kept buying them and loading them in. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'd walk around. I, I was at the Palo Alto Research Facility, and, and I'd walk around, and people would say, get out of here, because what we did, we took over half of the cafeteria for our data cells, and then we started taking over people's offices for the data cells because we just didn't have storage room. So they finally uh, booted us out and gave us another facility, which I'll mention a little bit later. Okay, here you can see the mechanism, and I won't spend time on this, but um, uh, you, you'd remove one of these one of these cells. That it had 40 megabytes, but it had mylar strips in it, and so to read a record, it would mechanically pick the strip, wrap it around a drum on an air bearing, and then it had heads, of course, that would seek the record on the strip, and then and it would read it. Okay. Then it would go through the reverse process. It would unwrap the strip, find the right cylinder for it, and then slot it back down into this uh, cylinder that you see here. Uh, and I should say cram, because uh, we all had uh, accordion uh, uh, strips nailed to our wall that didn't work well. We had one IBM maintenance guy on, on site at all times for the purpose of repairing that thing. Okay, so in designing the language, uh, these are maybe more important points, but uh, I saw searching as a process, not as a probe, a little bit, and, and uh, that as a process it had to be interactive so that you could guide your search into what you wanted, a little like a guided missile as opposed to a ballistic missile uh, with feedback. And uh, so we said, okay, the process needed to be cumulative and recursive. By recursive, it meant the results of a particular search could be used as arguments in a subsequent search statement. So it kept going without having to rekey stuff that you did before. That also, if you had like a four concept search and each concept had a, a multitude of terms to describe it, you could develop the concepts one at a time, hone them down to what you wanted, then intersect them to get your final result. It's a little bit like uh, pounding a nail with one blow of a hammer versus being able to pound it with several blows of a hammer. So we felt that would be more powerful. Um, okay. Here are our first prototype commands. Begin, well, you, you can read that, but begin you use to, uh, to define the subset of the total database on the system that you're going to search. Expand, then, uh, one time when I was over in the library, the Stanford Library, I was going through the catalog looking for something or another, and I'd look and look and didn't find it and didn't find it. So I went to the library and I said, well, do you have a listing of all of your subject headings? Oh, no, we don't have that. You know? Well, I said, well, then I don't know how to formulate this thing I'm looking for. So from that, I decided that we were going to have a, an expand command which provides a display alphabetically of near terms to an input term of all the searchable terms in, in the database. And then select is the, is a, is the Boolean command, and uh, it uh, uh, enables the recursion because the results of one select are numbered, and, the, and that number then can be used in the, as an argument in the subsequent search. Okay, so for a... But with the generality of those commands, you could do a lot more than... Uh, well. Than, than simply uh, searching. And you could do this because the records that we had uh, are fielded and tagged. That means that you, know, you can limit or sort or do things on any field or any tag in the database. So here's a little simple ex example of a search for MRI. You want to find an expert MRI for multiple sclerosis. So you go through the search here. 
Uh, the parentheses indicate that you want word adjacency because if you put a number in there, then it says you want these things within so many words of each other for a better specification. And uh, you can see a number of uh, things that go on there. And uh, so we go down in the fourth line and limit it to human. And then we rank the results according to the author, according to the frequency that the author occurs in those articles. And then that gives you the top writers from that database in, uh, in uh, MRI use for multiple sclerosis. So that's one, one example. And this one, <laughs> this is really neat, but uh, I've never found any use for it, re any real use for it. But what we did here, what I did here is uh, I went through, a, I constructed a database of 52 million journal articles. Okay, and that then was my, uh, my, uh, my space, my uh, article space, and went in and, uh, and selected it down by year from 1981 to 2004. And then I input uh, search terms, uh, dialogue, uh, Google, um, internet, and, and the word online, just to see how, when, when, when these words started appearing in the literature, and the, these were technical journal articles. Um, and then, and, you know, put them in an Excel spreadsheet and did a plot. Um, but like for dialogue, I couldn't just put in the word dialogue, uh, so I limited that or I intersected that with uh, Lockheed or Knight Ritter or Maid or information retrieval, you know, so that I would just get the context that I wanted. I had a few problems with Google at first. Can anybody guess what those were? How I had to uh, uh, limit Google? Well, I took I'd out. Uh, I said Google, not I'd, okay, E-Y-E-D, because Google I'd is a favorite expression. And then I took out the word Barney also, you know, if that were coupled with Google. So that's the way I got Google. And uh, so what can you see with this thing? Well, it's kind of interesting to see it, the yellow line is, is the word internet and the number of articles containing the word internet. And you can see that about 19, what, 1988, 89, the uh, frequency of occurrence of internet uh, exceeded or passed uh, the frequency of use of dialogue. And then you see, um, you see it got more popular. I mean, and um, the word online w was pretty well up there. And after 1995, it follows uh, pretty much the uh, curvature of, uh, of internet, because internet and online are used a lot simultaneously. But now with Google, we see Google coming into the literature in 1997, you know, at a very at a very low level, but then going up at a at a rather rapid rate, and then, um, uh, well, it looks like it's tailing off. But I had to plot this, I had to convert the raw numbers by log base 10 in order to get everything to plot on the same uh, on the same scale. So that Google line is is very impressive. I did it separately also. Um, now, I did it separately because I, I, I would like to feel that uh, a curve like this kind of indicates at least the popularity or the recognition of an institution or a process or a company. And I thought maybe I could make a lot of money on the stock market by watching these curves and seeing when they tail off. And, you know, never have, but could. Okay, how are we doing? Yeah, that's not bad. Okay, so. Um, Anyway, so here we were in the Lockheed Research Lab. And we had our little tool, and it was working pretty good on these little toy databases that we put together. Uh, but I needed a, a real database to, uh, for proof of concept. NASA had the only real database at the time. They had a database of 200 citations. These are brief citations, you know, title, author, so on, descriptors, of, uh, of research reports, of uh, NASA-sponsored research reports. So I went to Mel Day, who was in charge of that, and I said, we have this, you know, this great technique that's going to save you a lot of time and, and help the researchers. He said, yeah, I get about three or four people a week coming in telling me that they have things like that. So when you have something to show me, come back. And I said, well, I need your database in order to show you. And he said, fine. And he gave me some tapes that I took back, and I had my database. So we worked on that, and that worked pretty good. And I went back and showed it to Mel. 
and then gave them an unsolicited proposal for an Ames for a prototype to be worked over here at Ames Research Lab. Um, uh, anyway, we, we installed that and, and, uh, and it was very well accepted. What that did for me in Lockheed was to get me moving away from independent research dependency, which is uh, an awful thing to be dependent upon because there's so much competition. I mean, we, we had projects going in all the technical sciences that were funded by independent research, as well as uh, oh, some speech recognition. I remember that one. Uh, some character recognition stuff. I mean, most of the things that we've seen make some progress over the past many years. We didn't at the time. Uh, but then NASA was pleased with that, and so they came out with an RFP, a request for a proposal for the NASA-wide recon system. And we bid that with about 20 other companies at the time and were awarded the contract. And that's really what got us going, I mean, was the funding to develop that software, which we then could use elsewhere. Anyway, uh, Recon is still going within NASA, not what we wrote because it's been changed uh, and developed over time. But uh, a key thing here was in the contract, we wrote what's called a rights and data clause. A rights and data clause says that whatever we develop is their property, but we have the right to use that property. And that gave us the right then to develop uh, successive generations of dialogue. So we had two or three other contracts. ESRO is the European Space Research Organization. We installed a system in Darmstadt, Germany for them. Uh, we got another contract from the Atomic Energy Commission at that time for their database and installed a system there. And there was another database around called ERIC, which is Educational Resource something or another. Anyway, it's educational. It indexes and abstracts educational material. I said, this is a database that should be on dialogue. So I went back to Washington and met with a fellow named Lee Birchenall and talked with him and said, you know, we'd like to install our software on your computer and then you can have a lot of people search this stuff. And he said, we, we don't have a computer. What you can do if you want is take our database and install it on your computer and then we'll pay you to do the searching. Okay, now this, the, you know, this, it finally sunk in. But, but uh, uh, this was an uh, elegant realization. We had moved from the contract business, systems development and contracting, where you die at the end of every contract, to a services business, which is addictive. As you get people using your service, as you all know, and they don't stop, they keep going. So that's what got us into, uh, into the services business and uh, moved us into a commercial launch in 1972. We had about four databases online at the time. Um, and one of our early objectives, and one of the things we saw with third generation technology was mass random, mass random access storage, which gave us the database capability, interactive programming, which meant that you know, we could have interactive searching, but also telecommunications, which then gave us the potential of a global market. So we went after the global market at that time. Um, well, we were fortunate. Uh, the Japanese had heard about dialogue somewhere in one of the meetings, and so I, I had two visits from two different companies that wanted to be our representative in Japan. And I was apprehensive about Japan because, you know, I, I knew nothing about it. I didn't know how they'd market. I didn't know how they'd price the thing. I thought they might just price it out of, out of business. Um, so what I did was I, I, I made distributor contracts with each of the two Japanese organizations, and they were competitive then in Japan. And that gave us the competitive advantage on pricing, on marketing, on appearance at uh, conferences, and so on. And uh, so that was a very good move in, in, in terms of dealing with the unknown there. And I have a couple of pictures uh, in a moment on that. Well, in fact, uh, the, we went first to Canada, then to Great Britain, Europe, Japan, South America, and Australia, and this was all during the 70s. And we were the first, we established distributor relationships in each of those countries, and we were the first retrieval service in those countries. And as time went on, uh, we simply dominated the marketplace. And, and that's really the way to do it if you can. Um, okay, uh, but I, I, I just want to show you a couple of Japan things. The, the distributors, each one would invite me over and gather a different audience together to uh, be uh, lectured to. And we would 
my, my talk would be uh, translated, let's see, not simultaneously, sequentially. I mean, I'd say something, it'd be translated. And that's just a great way to give a talk because you have all this time then to think about the next thing that you're going to say. So I, I had a good time there. Um, I mentioned one of my interests was in music, and uh, I got my first synthesizer. Uh, bought it off the street in Japan and, and uh, carried it back on the airplane. But then, um, let's see. So that was international uh, expansion. Then in terms of business strategy, um, okay, I, I, I've always said that uh, profit is a constraint, not an objective. You know, in other words, you really have to be profitable to stay in business, but if you make profit the objective, then you're thinking wrong. I mean, your objective should be service, the service that you provide to customers. And if you do that and they need your service, and you know how to run the business, then profit is likely to result, it's going to result. So we operated that way. Uh, we, uh, we tried to offer the service at the lowest price possible. And this is contrary to a lot of what other people do because they want, they, they, if they have a new product, they want to put it on the market at a high price to get the first adapters, you know, kicking in those high bucks. But what that does also is it allows other people to do business plans that make sense against your pricing. So I priced it low, and the reason was uh, so that uh, competition would find it difficult to do a, a feasible business plan against Dialog. Um, the, the third thing was that uh, we, we provided comprehensive coverage, I mean, across many, many different disciplines, I mean, any, many that you can name. And, and people would ask me, well, why don't you, you know, you don't know what you're doing, why don't you focus your service into one of these areas instead of all of them? Well, the realization is that information problems don't slot themselves into discipline organized information. I mean, and I, I used to think that disciplines were created for the convenience of librarians and school teachers. You know, rather than for problem solving. So we wanted a system that people could sit down once, go through the whole thing, solve their entire problem, get up and go on to something else. And that was, a, um, uh, that was one of our objectives. Okay. Oh, well, we did that, we did that. Okay, then in terms of just the, the chronology of this thing, uh, we were spun out as a separate corporation in 1982, and we moved to a separate facility. And this, this was our facility at the corner of Arastradero and Hillview up in Stanford Industrial Park, and it was really a neat place. Uh, when, when they started talking about this, the facilities, the, the facilities people at Dialog said, oh no, it's much too expensive up there, you know, we want to move you, we have this really low cost area down in South San Jose that we'd like to move you to. You know, and, and uh, I argued and argued and argued because uh, as I think your philosophy here is, you know, you want to provide people a place to work that they want to come to. And, um, and that argument didn't, didn't uh, sell for much uh, within Lockheed. But what finally did sell was Palo Alto's uh, uh, utility costs because Palo Alto buys their electricity from the reclamation district, I believe, they have the lowest costs in the area. So I could do a nice little analysis showing that, because we were chewing up a lot of air conditioning and, and computer uh, heat costs at the time, that it was cheaper really to locate in the Stanford Industrial Park, which we did. And we stayed there as long as I was uh, active. We just loved it. Anyway, then, uh, well, the, the separate incorporation was really setting us up to be sold, we've realized later on. And um, Knight Ritter, well, we went on the market with what's called a Goldman Sachs auction. Anybody ever heard of a Goldman Sachs auction? Well, this is a very formal process that they go through in terms of getting indications of interest. Then they ask, well, how much would you be willing to pay? And each time they're narrowing down the candidates until they get a final small list, a short list of candidates and then we do presentations and take them out to dinner and you know get acquainted with them and then they ask for the final sealed bid and uh, Knight Ritter won the bid in 1988 with a 353 million dollar bid and that, that that turned out to be about uh, three and a half times our sales at the time which were about 100 million dollars and 14 times profit so it was a very very lucrative thing for dialogue 
one reason that it worked so well was that uh, the Lockheed management cooperated with the dialogue management in putting this thing together. Uh, we wound up, we in dialogue, I mean our attorney, uh, wound up writing the sales contract and it was a non-negotiable sales contract that these people were bidding on. In the sales contract, we said all benefits will be uh, continued. Uh, uh, I had set up profit sharing for the first time within uh, Lockheed. And so we had a profit sharing plan and you know, the provision was profit sharing would be continued and all these kinds of things. So um, Knight Ritter came through. The other bidders were, uh, well, a company called Maxwell, Lexus, Nexus was another bidder. Um, um, well, let's see, uh, American Express was one and there were a couple of others. Um, but that's a whole story in itself. I mean, that process was totally fascinating uh, to go through and to see how they, um, uh, how they operated. We had a fellow named Sykes that was in charge of it from Goldman Sachs. His nick nickname was Tiger Sykes, you know, and he was a tiger. Uh, he had about five or six of these projects going at the same time, and when we'd see him, we were absolutely certain that we were the only project he had any interest in. I mean, he was that, that clever. Okay, so when we moved to our new facility, uh, this is a picture of a handsome young man. Uh, and and uh, what we called our disk acres. And th these were all our databases, and there are no mirrors there. I mean, they just went back the whole list of the room, uh, the whole length of the room. And, um, and, and we increased space for a long time, until about 1985. And then even though we were increasing our storage, we were reducing the floor space that, was re it, that it required. We doubled our storage every three years. Every three years, we doubled our storage, which meant we doubled our information. Okay, competition. Uh, I don't know that you're that interested in this, but there was Systems Development Corporation with a system called Orbit. BRS was a price leader. Um, there's a story there too that uh, I don't think, I know. I don't have time to tell you. Uh, National Library of Medicine had Medline operating, and uh, that was heavy competition because they offered it basically for free, and they could do that because of the fixed cost of uh, capital equipment in the government. They had no write-off or depreciation. And then uh, LexisNexis and then uh, Chemical Abstract Service, uh, who uh, uh, endeavored to monopolize the chemical industry and did that by withholding and withdrawing databases from uh, uh, organizations like ourselves we brought an antitrust suit against the American Chemical Society on this basis and uh, probably would have won it, uh, except it hadn't completed by the time I retired and, and uh, Knight Ritter was tired of paying all these lawyer fees. And so they settled it for, with no benefit to dialogue. Okay, here's, anyway, here's what our sales and profits look like. Um, this is an interesting curve in that if you Look down, I, I should have brought my little pointer, but if you look at the yellow and the purple lines, uh, the uh, yellow line is the profit percentage and the purple line is the profit dollars. And so where the, where the profit dollars and the profit percentage cross happens to be 1988, which is right the time the dialogue set to sell and did sell dialogue. Oh, gee, that's well, that's great. See it right there. It's kind of slick. Um, that turns out to be the year also that the word internet in that previous slide, uh, the frequency of occurrence of internet in articles crossed the frequency of occurrence of dialogue. So they, they picked, and, and you can see this, there's a point of inflection in our sales curve at about that same time. So Lockheed picked a good time to, uh, to sell dialogue. Okay, so. Why were we successful? Well, the comprehensive database collection allowed one-stop searching across multiple disciplines. And uh, one thing I learned in operations research was the strategy that always came out on top was a dominant strategy. So instead of compromising one attribute and another attribute, we tried to dominate in, in every attribute. Um, and we've, we've gone through uh, some of the rest of these. Uh, all Dialogue employees had a free password and that helped in uh, selling. Uh, I had a budget, we, we hired people as we could afford to hire people. 
and, and my affording to hire people was based upon a, a metric of $300,000 a year in revenue per employee. That was back in the days when dollars were more and dollars were valued more and people were paid less. Um, Okay, and then in terms of philosophy, this is kind of an IBM philosophy, but uh, we had many, many classes and courses to develop our customers. Our customers were mainly the technical library community, the research librarian, as opposed to end users or even research scientists. And there, th th that's a, another story. Okay, now I'll just pass on, whoop. <laughs> I mentioned I transmitted these slides in quite a hurry. Um, okay. Let, uh, oh, there we go. It is. I did. No, oh, that's for, well, well, we'll do them here. Well, no, I just, I, I want to, I'll dwell on, I won't dwell on this, but I'll let people take a look at it because uh, this was my philosophy and we know where nowhere approached uh, what Google has been able to do in terms of hiring good and capable people, although two of our best are not working for Google, of course. Uh, uh, one is sitting here in the chair, uh, Jonathan, and the other is uh, Kathy, uh, Kathy Gordon, and maybe there are others here from Dialogue, I don't know. Okay, make a profit a constraint, not an objective, I mentioned that. And uh, okay, ma maximize market share, not profit margin in a new business endeavor. And you see this going both ways, but uh, price too high, you don't get market share, you just attract competition. So you know, price it low and bring folks in. Uh, okay, and analyzing, uh, oh, that, that didn't, yeah, it did, no. Yes, it did. Okay, uh, well, analyze quantity as well as dollars. Most, a lot of companies, because they're run by accountants, just look at dollars. But look at quantity of whatever it is you're selling or serving. And in doing a customer analysis, you know, don't just look at net customers that you have. Look at the increment that you've gained over a period of time. Look at the increment that you've lost. Because each of those phenomena require different decision making. Uh, AOL, I think, learned that somewhere along the line. Uh, okay. And, and uh, you know, Wall Street isn't the only one that should share in the rewards of business success. Let's bring the employees and the customers into this uh, metric, in, into this equation as well. And of course, Google epitomizes this. And uh, okay, this is, this is one that uh, they don't teach in business school, but uh, that management has an institutional responsibility which extends beyond fiduciary to custodial. That is to say that management has a responsibility to maintain a business in business as opposed to just dumping it when it you know, loses a little profit or on one of the ups and downs. And the reason for that is because society has come to depend upon the services that that company provides. So I feel that that's a, a real responsibility that should be, uh, <laughs> this, one, uh, this one didn't bullet. Okay, and then these are just some uh, little aphorisms that I've found useful, I guess. Uh, it used to bother me, I, I had, when I went to school, uh, there were a lot of really wealthy kids, I mean, whose parents were wealthy, that seemed very insecure. And I tried to figure that out over a long time and, and finally came to this conclusion that if there is a social need for your personal resource, then you will get more security from knowing that society depends upon you and that you can contribute to society than you get from just having a, a bundle of wealth which is kind of empty. And the system does work, get diligent and disciplined payoff, win your battles, allocate time to the process of random opportunity generation. You have to generate opportunities at this end, but you have to prepare yourself at the back end so that you can meet and fulfill and realize those opportunities as they come in. Um, and then recognize the vast individual differences between people, and that came from that individual differences book. Uh, uh, it, 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 it gives you a little more tolerance, you know? And, and then uh, exclude misunderstanding before placing blame. I mean, I, I know people that if something goes wrong, the first thing they do is look for somebody to blame, you know, somebody or some event to blame. And uh, much of the, m many of the issues come from misunderstanding. And uh, the final thing is coupling confidence with patience to realize success in your endeavors. 
Um, and I think this was the most important uh, characteristic that I was able to, e that I either had or was able to develop because it took, I was confident that what we were doing, that there was a need in society for what we were doing, but it took a long time to develop it and uh, to get it recognized to a point um, that, uh, that we could realize success from it. Okay, just a couple of more quickies and then we're done. Uh, Jonathan uh, and Kathy have given me tours of Google and uh, uh, made me better aware of uh, Google uh, in addition to my own research. And uh, so these are things that just fascinate me. First of all, the retrieval speed is just beyond my imagination. Terrific. Uh, the number of uh, simultaneous searches handled. You know, <laughs> we were running on uh, mainframes and as, as our business grew and became more popular, guess what, guess what happened? Response time suffered. So it was always a push-pull thing, you know, adding more capacity, improving our programming to, uh, uh, to keep response time up. And your response time is fantastic. Great facilities. You have uh, core values that uh, Jonathan shared with me uh, on a piece of paper. And uh, they're, they're, they're great core values. They're exactly the way a business should be run in my view. Uh, democratization of the information, of information access by making the service free you know, you've drawn in a community that's unbelievable, uh, that's unbelievable by any other terms. Uh, there's a company called Viewtron that Knight Ritter put together, oh, years ago to uh, test uh, sort of popular information retrieval on theaters and restaurants and so on. And they, they got about 30 people that they signed up in Florida for that, maybe it was 50, you know, gave them free terminals, free service, try it out, tell us what you like. They then a little bit later, they put a price of, I think it was $10 a month, you know, to subscribe to the service. And their number of customers went from 60, let's say, to zero the next month. So uh, free is great. Um, hiring policies, uh, insisting on specified term contracts. I mean, uh, going out to suppliers and saying, okay, here's the contract, folks. And we've tried to make it as balanced and equal as we can but it's, it has to be a take it or leave it. You can take it and join or not join as you choose. Uh, in doing our supplier contracts, we negotiated those contracts. And so we wound up with, oh, probably as many different terms and conditions in the contracts as we had contracts. And it's been a headache throughout, uh, you know, throughout trying to manage dialogue and trying to put together a service. And then um, uh, the product development and innovation, of course, and the last thing is uh, your, your webcast, the webcast of the analysts meeting that happened a month or so ago. And uh, doing that as a webcast was just great. I watched it as a shareholder, and it's the first time I've ever attended an analyst meeting for a company that I had held stock in. So that was a terrific idea. And of course, it's posted, so we can go back and look at it anytime we want. Okay, final thought is from Mark Twain. And I'll just let you read that. And I have to say, you know, as I reflect on my 30 years or so in this business, uh, uh, I, I totally agree with it. So throw off your bow lines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, and discover. Thank you. Thank you.